Everybody, please welcome to the Apple Store, Tom Hiddleston and Ren Schmidt. Hello. Thank you, sir. Hi. Yes. Um, tell me what you, or what was your familiarity, what was your awareness of Hank Williams before coming on board for this project? I knew uh, four or five of his hit records, and I didn't know much about the man or or the, the uh, impact he had on so many musicians who came after him. And I, I just read the script and I saw a fascinating portrait of a man who clearly had extraordinary gifts and powerful charisma. But behind that was a vulnerability and a fragility, which I think gave the music its power. And Ren, though we perhaps know you from best from the Atlantic City uh Boardwalk Empire uh, location. You did grow up south of the Mason-Dixon line, so. I, I did, but my parents aren't from there. Okay. My, my, pa my dad is from Kansas and my mom is from New York State, so I wasn't that familiar with Hank Williams until I became a part of this project, other than I think kind of his big hits that everybody knows, like Hey Good Looking and Cold Cold Heart, um, and I'm So Lonesome I Could Cry. And so it's actually been kind of a real gift to be able to explore that as an adult, because I think I now interact and listen to music, you know, much differently than I did when I was younger, and it means a lot more to me, you know, because I've had relationships where I feel like I can actually identify with some of what he's singing about. Yeah. There are other great artists. There were other great country artists. Why is it that this guy holds this power that, that nobody else does? It's, it's, it's a question that continues to be answered, I think. Um, and I think it's that, again, it's the tension between his macho charisma. His, his, he was clearly an electrifying on stage. He was rebellious, he was mischievous, he was witty and funny and energetic. A real star, but, but that actually it, it, he was in real pain in private. And, and that tension, I think, is what has fascinated people. And uh, what certainly was, must have been the most daunting part of all of this was not just agreeing to play this part and take on an acting role, but to take on a singing role and to actually perform these songs as the voice of Hank Williams. What I did was I, I, went, in, I went to Nashville five weeks ahead of time and before we were shooting, and I stayed at the house of Rodney Crowell, who is a, a respected Nashville musician in his own right. And uh, he has a studio in, at the back of his house and I, I just locked myself in. We, we sang every day, we played every day. We, we laid down demo tracks. Um, we listened to them, we criticized them. Um, we wrung our hands and shook our heads about them. Um, we listened, we played the blues, we played Howlin' Wolf, we played Jimmy Reed. Um, we poured ourselves a whiskey and watched Freddie Mercury videos on YouTube. It was a long, it was a long uh, journey of, uh, with, with much bloodshed and, and sweat and sleepless nights, but it was joyful as well. So we have a clip, um, and we can uh, take a look at a little bit of the little bit of the singing piece of the film that we'll run right now. Tom Hiddleston sings Hank Williams, honky tonkin. Um, so as we got a little bit of a taste in that scene too, another part of this film is the uh, another part of the Hank story or the relationships to the to the women in his life. Um, Ren, talk to us a little bit about your, uh, your role in the film, uh, what, who Bobby Jett was and how she figured into, into all of this and, and into, the, into the Hank story. Sure. So um, I feel like Bobby Jett is kind of the, the woman that is fairly unknown um, who Hank had a relationship with in between his first and second marriage. And I think I'm correct in saying he was still married to Audrey when they met. Yes, Technically, um, yes. technically still married. Um, they met at a party at the house he was living in with Ray Price. Um, and then they kind of had a, I think, a very heated but short-lived relationship that resulted in a child ultimately, but was also cut short by the fact that Hank Williams saw the beautiful Billie Jean at a concert. And I think the rest is history there. Um, she is a person kind of puts herself out there when she's pregnant and says like, hey, let's make a go of this. And I think a little bit as a person, that's really kind of, you're taking a huge risk. Um, and because it's 
true to history. I don't think I'm spoiling anything here, but he ultimately kind of shuts that down, and it's it's heartbreaking. You know, if there's a parallel narrative to the to the narrative of the songs in the film, it's certainly these relationships with these women, um, from the mother through the wives through the relationship with Bobby. Um, what did you, uh, you know, what did you find in thinking about Hank Williams and his his human interactions and 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 especially his you know, the, these these deeper relationships. Mark Abraham's great suggestion throughout the screenplay is that the power of the songs comes from the the volatility uh, of his relationships with women, um, uh, with with Audrey and and with Bobby and Billy Jean, and with his mother, and with his mother, of course, yeah. But I, that's really what the film is about for me: is it's about trying to draw together the music with these turbulent relationships with women. And I, and I think there's a contradiction in him that he clearly loved women so much, but was unintentionally cruel to them, to each of them, because he was afflicted by addiction and his own rebelliousness and his self-destructive nature prevented him from any lasting intimacy with them, um, which is tragic in my mind. So we have one more clip uh, to, uh illustrate some of what we're talking about, a clip with Ren and with Tom in it, uh, to show some of what this, these relationships are like. So let's look at that one. So how did you even think about, how do you get inside this guy? I mean, all we know really is the public face of Hank Williams. The, there are a few audio recordings, and I would listen diligently to them to try and find the gaps in, the, in the, the breaks in the character. And there's a couple of, of surviving concerts uh, on an album called The Lost Concerts where really people have recorded the music for posterity, but the clues for me are in these uh, pieces to the audience between the songs where he's almost like a stand-up comedian. He's hilarious. And um, he doesn't sound like his radio show performer at all. He's, he's sort of doing bits. He's mocking his bandmates and he's um, sending himself up and, and he's very, very funny. Um, and I, I found his wit and his sense of mischief. I was like, there's a, there's a key in there somewhere. For, for both of you, I ask, having lived with this guy and this idea for all of this time, um, you know, what do you, what do you feel like is the thing that you took away? What is the, what is the Hank Williams that you took away from this project? I feel like that's so hard to say because the thing, I mean, the thing that I feel like I could take away is that he's a deeply flawed, beautifully complex human being underneath all of the surface things that people normally interact with him with, which is, which is his music and him as a performer. I think, I think that having made this film and, and, and thought so much about Hank, Live, tried to live inside his shoes and tried to get inside his heart. Um, the thing I learned about, I, 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 Hank has taught me so much about um, the fragility of artists, I think. Um, and the reason music like this has an enduring appeal is because it speaks to a universal human fragility, that we're all vulnerable, that we all are bound together by an experience of the same suffering. That's why, we, that's why we all understand the songs. Why do we sing I'm so lonesome I could cry? Because we've all been there. And um, that's what it taught me about Hank. All right, somebody's, somebody's got a microphone, so we'll get questions from you guys. What does it feel like to be so many different characters from all movies? It's kind of like traveling to lots of different countries. And uh, when you travel to another country, you realize that there are certain things that are different, but there are certain things that are the same. And that's the fascinating part for me. When you go to play someone else, you get to live their life. And it actually just makes me, it, it, I find it very exciting because it's, um, it's, uh, it opens your mind and it opens your heart and you learn more about people. Um, 
and you come back home with uh, lots of stories to tell. And um, I love doing it. That's what it feels like. Hello, um, this is a question for Tom as well. Um, I was just wondering if you think that your experiences as a stage actor influenced um, how you might have thought of the challenges Hank Williams might have faced as a live performer as well. There's a very unique feeling of standing in the wings before you go out on stage and you can, you can hear the audience taking their coats off and shuffling in and getting ready and you can you sense the lights going down and and there's an there's an electric adrenaline that happens in that moment um but that then the singing thing is a whole other aspect of it it's much more singing is the most naked uh expression of of emotion you know actors can hide behind characters but when you're singing it comes right from your heart um so that was new new territory for me um, this is for Tom. Um, did you have to learn any new instruments for the role, or if you like already knew how to play the guitar, like did you learn how to play it like differently? Or the interesting thing about Hank's music is that the guitar, the rhythm guitar, isn't that complex. They used to say blues music is three chords and the truth. Um, so, but with the exception of Lovesick Blues, which he didn't write, which is much more complex um, and, and 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 by far the most demanding. Um, but yes, I did. I practiced and practiced and practiced, and my fingers bled, and I got calluses. And um, but it was, you know, I now have that forever. I, I have, I still have a guitar that was given to me by Rodney Crowell in Nashville. So, J forty five Gibson. It's beautiful, and I play it all the time. So I feel like I've, the, the, you know, I've come away with something that I'll have for the rest of my life. It's it's really cool. My question is for both you guys. Is there a specific artist or genre that you really feel had an impact on your life? Like you feel like if the music wasn't in the world, like it just wouldn't be complete? Can I, can I have two? <laughs> um, the Rolling Stones and Simon and Garfunkel. Um, do you, just to follow that and then, do you find that you, do you listen to music differently since, uh, since the Hank Yes, work? I do, yeah. yeah. Um, I, li I listen to the, a combination of its precision and its freedom. That there's some, you know, certain artists who have such control, such mastery of their instrument, and and the freedom with which they can play it. Um, I find that so inspiring. Um, I'm still in awe of musicians, essentially. Um, um, and having tried to live inside it, I have, I think, I have a greater respect for it. To answer your question, I, I want to as well. Um, the, f the first band for me would be Radiohead. I think they kind of came into their peak right when I was in my teens and it was the first band that I think I ever was like, I had to get the album the day that it came out. I had to look at all of the liner notes and everything that was in the CD. And two, it's so funny because as soon as you asked that question, my heart started beating so fast because I was afraid. I'm so afraid I'm going to start crying talking about this. But Brandy Carlisle, her music for me, go out and find out about her. She's incredible. And if she plays a concert, go see it. She's one of the best live performers I've ever seen. I know I've read some things that have said you've been... Um, people have thought of you to play the next James Bond. Are you, would that be a role you'd be interested in? I grew up. I grew up with those films, um, and to, and the idea the idea is sort of in, is is it's almost beyond comprehension because it's they're so a part of the fabric of my childhood. Um, but thank you for for pitching. Thank you for pitching it. At least it's a Brit playing a British role, so we don't have to worry about the immigration issues of you know. So all right, um, I saw the light opens tonight. New York, Los Angeles, and Nashville next week everywhere else. Thank you, Ren Schmidt. Thank you, Tom Hiddleston. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, everybody.